all this is dr mubeen sayed from drbeen.com welcome to one more show uh, so the discussion today is about a small study 13 people healthcare workers healthy uh, vaccinated and the um, spike protein or the antigens found in their plasma the study's actual objective was to see how quickly can we start seeing the vaccine antigens in our cells after the vaccination and why were they doing that they were trying to understand how quickly mrna translation would occur and how quickly the vaccine would become uh, the antigen will become available that is one second piece that was interesting for them to understand was what kind of immune response will be produced how much will be the igg when will it be produced what will be iga levels and so on so these are the things that they wanted to understand they have not collected any clinically relevant data so from this study to be able to say that uh, we can tell clinically what would happen will they uh, were these individuals healthy and remained healthy my assumption is they were because there is no change in people's clinical course here but at the same time authors say we did not collect or we did not hypothesize anything about the clinical correlation and maybe separate studies are needed so this is the basic um, sci- uh, the study itself so let's look at this study so here and one more good news uh, dr tess lorry responded to me i had reached out to her and she did not respond before she reached out again um, i reached out again and she responded and said here was busy with the paper uh, she said she will be happy to join us so we will very soon have dr tess lorry with us as well okay so here we are this is drbean.com this is the study uh, in clinical infectious disease the study is only available in a pdf so i have the pdf itself over here as well and as you know i mark the pdfs when i'm studying so i've done the markings as well so now let's look at my art <laughs> so this is the latest art this is called uh, fading memories and um, i think i did this over this weekend this is also done digitally this is uh, digital oils using adobe fresco on ipad so with this let's <laughs> start our discussion i like to show off my art that's the child part in me so gifts for humanity let's continue with our discussion here is what we have here is a summary are there spikes in the plasma that is a common question from people the authors were not going out to answer this question they were trying to figure out when and how fast the messenger rna from the moderna vaccine will translate into making the proteins or antigens which are spike proteins and when will our immune system remove them that was their intention so what they found was the following so if you look at this diagram here the very first one this diagram i think from our previous discussions we know that there is an s2 part of the spike protein then there is an s1 part s1 part is further divided into the receptor binding domain which has receptor binding motif right so these are the parts in the plasma so i'm talking about the summary in the plasma of three people out of the 13 so i think about 23% they saw that spike protein was in the in the blood plasma out of how much was in the blood plasma is not quantified they did not quantify that how much was produced and how much was there they also have a hypothesis that how it was there i actually have talked about that kind of hypothesis in the past as well so i agree with their hypothesis but there may be more mechanisms the s1 part was present from the day 1 s1 not the whole spike protein the s1 part and they kind of felt uh, they were thoughtful about that as well to say why just the s1 and not the whole spike 
and they have uh, some answers to those. I have some answers to those as well. We'll talk about them. S2 was not detected. Spike was detected in three out of 13. That is one. Secondly, the nucleocapsid protein, which is also a viral antigen, they were testing for that as well. Why were they testing for that? They were testing for that to see if the person is actually producing antigens or spike proteins from the vaccine versus spike proteins from the virus. So if there is a virus that has infected and they are just taking blood and accidentally they're thinking that the antigens are coming from this the vaccine while they were coming from the virus, how did they rule out? They ruled it out by testing for nuclear or nucleocapsid proteins. And they wanted to make sure that this is not present. Not presence of the nucleocapsid protein will mean that these other proteins, the spike proteins, are produced by the vaccine because vaccine does not have RNA for the nucleocapsid. So if the person was infected, they will have nucleocapsid protein as well. So it, this is what they wanted to be negative. This is what they were hoping to be negative, And it was negative. So that means what they observed was vaccine created, except in one case where they had a suspicion that that person may have been asymptomatically infected. In addition to that, these two things, spike-related components, nucleocapsid component, and then they also wanted to understand that what is the situation with the antibodies? How is our immune response? So in the summary, something that would really be interesting for healthcare workers and for uh, all of us in general, after the second dose, there was no spike protein or S1 observed at all. Or they said, if these are present, they were present under the detectable limit of the test. One other important thing is that the test that they used was their own manufactured test. This uh, study was sponsored by Bill and Melinda Gates and some other. The test is their own test. However, I don't think that being the, the inventors of that test actually discredits any of the work here because I think the work is correct. It's a good work. So they saw immunoglobulin G to be produced against the S and spike protein, the S1 and spike proteins. And they also saw immunoglobulin A to be produced as well. And they claim that this was the first study of its kind that was looking for antigen production after the introduction of messenger RNA. And they said, we were able to do that because we have a special test that has many, many markers that can detect these pieces of the antibodies, or oh, sorry, antigens. They say in their paper that what is the clinical relevance? They say we do not know because that is not what they were going for. So was it dangerous or not for them? I think it was not. These uh, healthcare workers were healthy. They continue to be healthy. Otherwise, we would have heard. But anyways, this is the summary of the whole topic. Now let's look at the detail. So if you just wanted to hear the summary, that's the summary. You can um, then from here uh, disengage if you like. But I would love to have the <laughs> cool bean stay here with me. So study details. It is a prospective study. That is a study that is moving forward, not looking backwards. It's a good study when it is a prospective study. It is a pilot and a small study, meaning 13 people total. So they're saying this is a pilot study. We wanted to show something. And then we would expect larger studies to look at this phenomena. What did they do? They had 13 healthcare workers, I think, uh, from Brigham. And uh, what was the hospital name here? Somewhere here is the hospital name. I'll come across and I'll share that. OK, so 13 people. Median age was 24. And the reason that they specifically call this out as a limit or a weakness of this study 
is because this is the behavior in healthy people that they make trust they translate the vaccine they make spikes proteins and the immune system comes along clears out the spike proteins and they can show both but what happens in uh, let's say immunocompromised or what happens in folks who may be in the advanced stage uh, advanced age or what happens in other groups they do not know they said this is healthy young people hospital workers hopefully they were not covid they didn't have history of covid but they suspected that one person had either a past asymptomatic history or there was something else going on so we'll we'll come across that they had an equal balance of gender so men versus women there was a balance between those of course they were not six and a half maybe six and seven and so on 18 years plus healthy individuals healthcare workers no history of covid at least they did not know the workers they did not know that they had covid they took the authors the researchers they took 10 to 3 plasma samples between the day 1 to 29 of after the first dose of the injection and between the day 1 and 28 of the second dose of the injection they kept taking plasma and this is once again they said we have not seen any other study that did this continuously taking plasma and continuously measuring the spikes or the s1 and so on now what were they looking for they were looking for so their testing system that they have invented that helps them look for these things so they were looking for s1 part of the spike protein that means the uh receptor binding domain and the receptor binding motif and they were looking for the whole spike as well and why were they looking for those they were trying to figure out if the rna translation or this the vaccine starts becoming converted to spike or not or how soon does it start becoming converted does it take a day or two days or 10 days or how much then they were looking for n as well and they were hoping that there will be no n because presence of the n would mean the person is actually infected by the virus instead of making these antigens from the vaccine findings what did they find they found so findings have to be divided in two doses generally the summary of the finding is after the first dose they saw the s1 or the part of spike protein present then they saw after some days the spike protein in some people 3 out of 13 after second dose they saw nothing no s1 no spike protein nothing all clear that means the immune system got trained enough to clear it out which i love because that is the point one question that had been in my mind for a long time and that was is one dose sufficient of the vaccine and this study at least shows that one dose is not sufficient after one dose the spike levels or the uh, the antigen levels started reducing when the immune system started becoming active but they had the levels when they gave the second dose it cleared out everything these spikes and these s1s that means the booster was needed now still there is a question and that question is booster on day 28 or after 84 days in as in uk so of course uk studies have proved that they have boosters after 84 days and it works very well because the first dose continues to rise the immunoglobulins there is another um take away from here let's say if we are concerned that these s1 pieces or the spike pieces in some people are going to cause issues i don't believe that they would cause issues but let's assume for a second that we agree that it these would cause issues then the quicker the second dose the quicker these things are removed so that is also another important takeaway now if you think about it from uk's point of view folks who had 84 days gap they actually kept improving their immunity and they did not have any side effects bigger than others actually the second dose may have had side effects but not the first one so it seems like the spikes were not doing much but again from this study's point of view they did not give any spikes were doing damage or not damage they simply said we do not know the clinical relevance okay so back here first dose 100 microgram of the moderna vaccine 
11 participants on the same day of the vaccination. So I got the vaccine today and they're taking blood samples from me yesterday. That is day zero. And they're expecting that yesterday will be clear. I don't have an infection or a vaccine. So I don't have any antigens. Today, when they give me the vaccine, they wanted to see if I would have antigens or the spikes produced. And they saw that in 11 people, in their blood, they found the S1 part of the spike protein there. Again, this is not dangerous, but it is there. The question is, how much is there? I think that difference is not present. And the second is, it is why is it there? And they themselves have a few hypotheses. So we'll look into that in a second. But it started producing the same day. So messenger RNA translation started occurring the same day. That means that the lipid nanoparticles were able to enter the cells, use their messenger RNA, release their messenger RNA. Messenger RNA started helping to produce the spike protein on the same day. That is interesting. One person on the first dose, one person had S1 at day zero. One person had S1 at day zero, that is before the vaccination. And their hypothesis is, their thought is that maybe they have this S1 from fighting with other human coronaviruses, which can cause cold, or maybe that person was actually infected with asymptomatic infection. But that person was not vaccinated yet, but they had the pieces of S1 circulating in the blood. Three participants, so this is again the first dose, three participants, that is 23% of the small number, uh, spike antigen was present in the plasma. And once again, why was that present? I'll discuss that in a second. But it was present in the plasma, and on average, it stayed there for 15 days. That also is a very interesting point, that if the spike stayed there for 15 days, the question is, did it increase or reduce? They say that it started reducing when the antibodies started arriving. And the antibodies would start arriving after a few days. That means before the antibodies started arriving, spike proteins were produced. There, was, there would be a fraction of that that is going in the blood. That was not going anywhere. That means it was not binding to the cells and it was not disappearing. It was just circulating. This is what I had been saying, that if a spike protein enter a bloodstream, it's not going to get a chance to bind to ACE2 receptors because it is just moving too fast. So if it was going to start binding to ACE2s, so there is a possibility that, let's say, a lot of spike protein enters the blood. And let's say lot means 100. Out of 100, 99 bind to ACE2 on the blood vessels. And then one is circulating, which we collect and measure, which would mean there would be a huge vasculitis event that would occur. That means the person's whole body would start swelling up and they, they would start having vasculitis or the blood vessel related issues. We don't see them, but there are now possibilities. Out of how much did spill into blood, out of the one that is in blood, did any of that bind with ACE2? In my opinion, no, but anyways, that is still an unknown. No, no N antigen. So they did not see nucleocapsid antigen. That means this was from the vaccine and not the actual infection. Continuing. Now the question, and I want to show you this part on their paper as well. The question that why was the S1 present and why did they think that the spike was present? So if we go here. This is an important sentence. S1 in all participants declined and became undetectable by day 14. And then after those two, there was nothing. But here is an important one. This one. 
So the presence of S1 is likely due to the nature of the encoded messenger RNA 1273 that it has a which contains a cleavable S1, S2 site and enables release of S1 from the spike trimer. So they're saying that the way the spike protein is structured in the messenger RNA, it is the way that we can cleave it just like other original viruses as spike protein. So they say we hypothesize this in uh, orange. We hypothesize that release of S1 protein could result from cleavage via mammalian cell proteases or circulating proteases. What does that mean? They're saying maybe when the spike was inside the cell, the proteases cut it, which is which makes sense. Spike can actually be a bunch of this is going to be destroyed. I would I would hypothesize, and this is a hypothesis, that maybe 90% of the spike would actually be destroyed, which is produced inside the cell, would be destroyed by endosomes inside the cell. Then some of this is going to get on the surface, and some of this, as you can see, maybe some of this is spilling out. The one that is present, the spike protein, is going to be destroyed either inside the cell or outside. So they said that proteases, proteases are these enzymes that break proteins. They are going to cleave them and separate these two pieces. So that's what they, so this is their hypothesis. So then this broken piece, the S1 piece, is ending up in the blood vessel. How many ways can it reach there? We have done some discussions that, hey, if we wanted these things to enter the blood, this is the possibility. So let's see. Let's say this is a blood vessel. And let's say here we are producing spikes. One possibility, direct entry, will be that the particle size is so small. And what I do not know is that what is the size of S1 part? How small is that? Is that sufficiently small to get into the blood vessel through a capillary? capillaries gap junction. So let's say here is a gap junction. Gap junction is the gap between the cells. So this, I do not know the size, but let's say size is bigger, or let's assume that the size is there small enough that this is one way. Another way is that because there is local immune re response, an immune system is attacking the system, there are local inflammatory cytokines including the cytokines that would cause the gap junctions to open up. They would open up the gap junctions to bring more material into the area of fight, but that can help some pieces to escape as well. So this will be the second, that the blood vessel permeability has increased and then some pieces of spikes have entered there. Third possibility will be that lymphatics that are bigger channels, lymphatics from here will pick up the pieces, those pieces would wash away in the lymph. A majority of them are once again going to be cleared out. A lot of them are going to be cleared out here by the immune system, macrophages and the uh, dendritic cells and the neutrophils. Then a lot of them are going to be trapped here. And then some of them can go into the blood from the lymphatic. Lymphatic is the most um, easier route in terms of bigger particles to go. For a smaller particle, that may be smaller blood vessel entry as well. And then there may be, so this is the third, there may be more routes, which, um, for example, how can we produce more routes here? We can cause blood vessel damage, but um, we can't suspect that everybody had a blood vessel damage. So I would not kind of think of that as the problem. Um, I think either the size is small enough or the blood vessel capillary has opened up or the lymphatic route. I don't see any other route. There can be actually one more route. That will be an interesting one. That is neutrophils. Neutrophils, as I've discussed in the past, that neutrophils job, they are irresponsible chewers of the system. They pick up an antigen, they break it up, they throw the pieces out. Why do they throw them out? They want the rest of the immune system to start becoming activated by those broken up pieces. So can the neutrophils be throwing them out? Maybe. Anyways, from the author's point of view, they have not hypothesized about it other than saying S1 got broken off of the spike protein and it went somewhere. If you look at the latest hypothesis where folks have been saying that 
the S1 would be cleaved and re uh, removed, then this is the least possible one, but I'm going to put it out there. That is, if this spike binds with an S2, and it will have to bind here in this area, if it binds with an S2, and then the TMPRSS2 over here cleaves the S1 unit, and then that S1 unit is removed, then that could be floating could be floating around as well. Normally, the bound portions are not removed. The whole bound assembly with the, with the receptor is recycled. That means it is internalized, the receptor. It is broken up into pieces and destroyed, and the, the raw material taken from it and new receptor made. So our cells continue to make new receptors and bring them to surface and recycle the old receptors and take them in and destroy them. So if the spike protein has actually bound and cleaved off, then this S1 unit will become internalized in the cell and be destroyed there. So that, I know that this is a theory that many folks have been talking about, but this theory is a very difficult one, but we're gonna put that here as well. So there are these four possibilities. All right, going back here. So that is about the S1 unit. Now about the spike unit in three people. That was interesting for them. If you read it, they say, we observe an increase in S1 over an initial period of one to five days suggesting that messenger RNA translation begins immediately after vaccine inoculation. Interestingly, spike protein appears in three of 13 participants and average eight days after S1 is produced, eight days after. So then the question is why eight days after? So if, if the spikes are produced today, and if we can see the pieces S1 out in the blood, then why not spikes as well? Because we are assuming that these there were spikes here. Those spikes were broken down somehow. Their S1 removed and those S1 are seen in the blood. So then maybe there are spikes here that would eventually be in the blood as well. And if that is the case, then we should see them from the day one as well. And that is what they're thinking about too. That we see S1, but we don't see spike on day one. Actually, they don't see spike till day eight. So I'm going to ask this question from the cool beans here. What do you think happens on day eight? We have actually talked about these in the past. So here is what happens. They say we hypothesize that the cellular immune response, cellular immune response triggered in T cell activation. which would occur days after the vaccination led to direct killing of the cells. Which cells are these cytotoxic T cells? So what is they're saying is, so if I go back here from this one, and I, I actually I wanna read this one as well. They're saying the mechanisms underlying the release of free S1 and the subsequent detection of intact spike protein are actually unclear. They're unclear and require further studies. So this, they're giving hypothesis but they're saying we do not know how. Now the hypothesis for the eight days. What they're saying is, and I remember in majority of my discussions, I have done this talk that we may have spillage of the spike protein when a cell is broken. And the cell, uh, remember I used the analogy that when an egg is broken. So the cells will be broken, not on the day one, Day one, there is no antibody unless somebody had previous infection or a previous vaccine dose. For example, here, day, dose two produced the spike protein, but those spike proteins were immediately removed. So they did not even have a chance to end up in a blood, in the blood, which also means if somebody had infection and then they get the reinfection, in majority of the cases, infection, they would not even know that they were infected. So anyways, back here, day zero, we know that immune system will present the, will make this, the spikes, the cells, then they would present that to immune system, immune system, naive T cell would engage with that, T helper two, T helper one pathway would 
start becoming active. It would take multiple days, anyways, from five days to 29 days. Median is nine days and so on. We know that. And this is why clotting risk is from five days to 17 days and median is nine. This is why cardiac inflammation occurs after some days because that is immune related, not spike related. Otherwise, it would be the first day. From this study, you can actually see that the spikes are produced in the day one. So here, day one, immune system starts getting presented with the spikes. Day eight, this is hypothesis from the authors. It, it actually goes with my thinking as well. And that is day eight, the cells that are presenting these spikes are going to start getting destroyed by cytotoxic T cells. That is a T helper one pathway. And we know that cytotoxic T cells, they release perforins and granzymes, which will cause, if you see this little cell here, the one that is dead, other are kind of scared. This one is dead. So what is happening is that the cytotoxic T cell has punched a hole in the cell by releasing perforins. Then it is going to throw granzymes in it, which are going to go into the cell and cause caspases to become activated, which are the proteins that would activate ubiquitins, which are the proteins that would ask the cell to kill itself. The result is when the cell dies and it has holes in it. And when the cell dies, it membrane is going to rupture, rupture apart because membrane integrity needs living, breathing cell that has energy production. So when that mechanism is all gone, membrane, membrane would start breaking down as well. The content of the cell would start spilling out these content will have spikes. That is what they're saying here. We hypothesize that the cellular immune responses triggered by the T cell activation, which would occur day after the vaccination, led to direct killing days after, not day after, days after the vaccination, led to direct killing of cells presenting spike protein and an additional release of spike into the bloodstream on day eight. This on day eight is what I'm adding here. So this is why on day eight, we see a bunch of spikes. If the vaccine generated spikes were getting out, then we'll see them on the day one with S1. So that makes sense. So, OK, so that is their hypothesis. Uh, makes sense, though. Then next, what about dose two, the second dose? After the second dose, Day 13, no S1 antigen found in the blood, no spike protein found in the blood, and till 56 day they followed up and nothing found. So date second dose and all clear. Second dose is producing antigens. Why is it all, all clear? It is the immune system that has become ready to attack. And when you give the second dose and there are more antigens, it is attacking right away. So this is a good immune response. This is what we wanted. So good. And they say, authors, that our limitation is this is for healthy people, healthy individuals, young, 24 mean age, median age. How about immunocompromised? How about older folks? How about other groups, diabetics, cancer, hypertension, asthma? So they said, we don't know, and studies are needed. One more thing that was really important. This is very important. And I'll show, show, show this on the paper as well. They said when the, when the inf injection is given, the same day spikes, not spikes, S1 start getting produced. Spike on day 8 and onwards. So this spike over here, take it from day 8. eight. So the antigen is produced on the same day. And on day 14, Day 14, in some people, the IgG and IgA start becoming produced. But in majority, it was day 28 when the IgG and IgA ramped up. So the question is, why in these folks on day 14, and the author's hypothesis is that they may not know, but they may have been infected in the past and asymptomatically recovered. 
asymptomatically infected and recovered. So their body was ready. So as it was ready, they started producing the IgGs and As first. I have a slight disagreement with the authors here, and that disagreement is normally if we are vaccinated before or if we have uh, um, infection before, we would start generating antigens on the almost the same day, 24 to 48 hours. We will not wait for day 14. But anyways, I mean, the authors were not too hung up on that to say it has to be previously infected. They, this is just a conjecture. But there are some people who produced it on day 14. I would actually think that these were also newly vaccinated, not infected before. Their immune system just started making antibodies within day 14, while other people's immune system started making antibodies on day 8, 28. Important thing, that, so let me back up for a second. This second dose and the phenomena there should be the same phenomena with the infection and then reinfection. And that once again proves to me that after an infection and a healthy response to it by us, we don't need a vaccine. When the infection would occur, we would respond. And so somebody had sent me a comment on YouTube just, just before this talk uh, that there is some uh, article on Facebook where they are saying that the quality of the receptor binding antibodies is better with the vaccine than with the actual infection. And they had asked me to look into it. So I have not looked into it. Just on the, this message alone, the person recovered, quality was good or quality was bad. Person recovered, that means their body handled it whichever way it felt suitable. Why are we comparing it and then saying, well, this means vaccine should be given? Well, the person recovered. Isn't that sufficient? What are you giving the vaccine for? You're giving the vaccine to fight with that infection. And they have already proven that they fought with it. Anyways, that's a, besides the point here. Uh, day 14, antibodies started getting produced in some. Day 28 in others. And they said that as soon as the antibodies started getting produced, the spike and S1 started declining and then they disappeared. And they said disappeared, maybe that now they're all cleared out or maybe their, their test cannot detect. It is under the detection limit, which still is a fine thing. So this was the discussion. I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, the way they looked at it. Look at this IgG and IgA against S1 spike and RBD increases after S1 production in all participants. So interesting thing here, IgA is produced as well. That means the mucosal membranes protection is also there. Uh, then they talk about their own test here. Our SIMUA antigen assay cannot detect antigen antibody complexes. Most of the tests cannot detect this. What is this one statement? This is usually called a window period. So imagine that we have an antigen. This is an antigen, spike protein. This antigen would produce, will cause the immune system to produce antibodies against it. How do we detect the antibodies, these antibodies? We detect them by making antibodies against these antibodies. <laughs> so we detect, we create antibodies that are against the antibodies. Now these antibodies are fluorescent, they are luciferases, for example, they can shine when they bind. So when they are bound to the actual target antibody, then they shine and we say, all right, the antibody is present. But if this antibody, original antibody, is bound to the antigen, that is, it is in complex form, let's say this is part of spike protein, it is bound to it, then this test antibody cannot bind here. And because of that, it will not fluoresce. But there is antigen and antibody complex. So many times, antigen antibody complexes are not detectable by the tests. And that is what they're saying. We could not detect it. It's a very standard thing. So this is what they are saying. Nonetheless, evidence of systemic detection of spike in S1 protein production from the RNA vaccine, this is Moderna vaccine, is significant and has not yet been described in any other vaccine study. So they're saying we're the first one to show this. 
likely due to limitations in assay sensitivity and timing assessment, maybe by the other. The clinical relevance of this finding is unknown and should be further explored. Then finally, they say the induction of IgA, IgG and IgA immune responses can be detected as early as day five post vaccination and are associated with clearance of spike and S1 antigen in the systemic circulation. So as soon as the antibodies are produced, they would come and wipe them off. The question that is still left for me here is the following. That question is, what was the pile that was produced? This makes sense to me that these spikes did not appear in the blood till, till day eight. That means spikes were actually not being released. They came from the broken cell. It actually makes sense. But anyways, we'll see more. How much was produced out of it? How much spilled out? Out of that, how much went into the blood? One question that is still outstanding. The second question is, what is the clinical relevance of this? And please, uh, those who would say uh, that, well, the Japanese study has proved that there is some cytotoxicity. They have only proved the lipid nanoparticle. Then those who would say that there is another study that proved that there is cytotoxicity because spike protein binds with ACE2. Here, the spike protein actually continued to stay in the blood without binding. So that cytotoxicity is not possible. So what is the clinical relevance? It's just that, hey, this happens. Good, good to know. Or, hey, this would cause some damage. Not known yet. So this is where I will start. Please do me a favor. My standard request, please like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. Uh, one is to buy me a coffee. Other one is to use PayPal to support this work. And then there is another link to become a patron. With this, I'm going to take off and come back for a chit chat if you like. And we'll do a quick talk. There is a question here. So Grace says, I still don't get it that why are these spikes present on day eight if immune cells are breaking them and digesting them? So look, very simple. What is possibly happening? So we get this, this much part that on day eight, cytotoxic cells have become active and they are breaking our cells that have spikes in them. Got it. Now, why are those spikes in the blood? That is a question. So what would happen is, let's say we create, actually, let's stay on this diagram. Let's say we create this pile of spikes and we broke those cells like eggs and the spikes spilled out. A bunch of spikes are going to, majority of those are going to be eaten up by the macrophages and neutrophils here. They're going to start taking them up. A smaller part will probably run around. If there is too much inflammation, as I said before, if there is inflammation, then it is possible that maybe the, the gap between the capillary cells and endothelial cell, the gaps open up and the some spikes would enter from there. One possibility. Second is some go to the lymphatic system and then they are spilled from there. Third is, let's say a macrophage is getting the lipid nanoparticle in it. That went, goes to the lymph node. Over there, that macrophage is killed and that spills the spikes in the lymph node and those go in the blood. So the question is how much of those are in the blood? Are they all of them are in the blood? Then we have a different problem to solve. If there is a fraction, then we have a different problem to solve. So I think these are the pieces they did not look at, but at least they were able to see them in three out of 13. So this was also not uh, in everyone. OK, so with this, uh, once again, please like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you in five minutes.